This is a short revision video on employment and unemployment and it goes with the national economy part of economics AS level with AQA. This is actually the second time I've recorded this video because the first time I did it I listened back to it and my voice was so annoying I just had to do it again. We're just going to get a quick definition here of full employment. Full employment is when all who are willing and able to work have a job at current wage rates. This does not mean 100% employment as some people commonly believe. This is because some people are always going to be unemployed due to labour turnover or movement between jobs. So say I've got a job in accountancy, I want to go for manufacturing, I've got to acquire some new skills to get my job manufacturing. So there's going to be a bit of time between jobs that is frictional unemployment there. And then incapacity to work, some people are disabled, too old. So not everyone is ever able to work. So full employment is not 100% employment. We expect there to be, I think it's 2% unemployed at any one time for other reasons. We're now going to show employment on a Keynesian aggregate supply curve. If we look here at AD1, quite a few people are employed, obviously, because we're making quite a bit of output, but not everybody. There's still capacity to make more. So we shift along and more people are, un are employed when we get to AD2. We're producing more, we need more people. We've got a slight rise in output and a slight rise in the number of people being employed, but no real rise in price level. Obviously a small one, but nothing major. Then we go to AD3, where pretty much everyone is employed. Obviously, not everybody's going to be employed. Because you always have some people who have got loads of skills and are ready to be employed, but it's not the right skills for where we need them. So we'll have some people who will need to undergo retraining or stuff like that before we can get them a job in the economy at its current level. Obviously, this changes all the time, and the skills that people require are different. But in the moment, we've got some expanding firms, some workers with the wrong skills, train them, and then we can get them in. This will also enable us to produce even more. There are two big measures of employment, as you probably did at GCSE. The claimant count, and by its name, claim, you can tell it's to do with the number of people claiming unemployment-related benefits. This could be job seekers allowance, welfare benefits, stuff like that. And the government will look at how many people are claiming it, and that's the number of people the government says are unemployed. This actually gives us a lower figure than the figure it should give us, because not all unemployed people will claim unemployment-related benefits. Some people won't know it's available, won't want to take them, will have got enough savings that they don't feel they need to take them or they deserve to take them, stuff like that. Another measure of employment is the Labour Force Survey, which is a survey of a sample of households across the country, which counts people as unemployed if they're actively seeking work but don't have a job in the week of the survey. This figure is usually more accurate than the claimant count, but it's still a bit inaccurate because it's a sample, it's not the entire population, so it doesn't take absolutely everyone into account, and if they get the sample space wrong, then they could really screw up the figures and get really distorted numbers. We're now going to look at the link between unemployment and inflation, and why they are so hard to get both of them at the level you want when you're using all the policies because they they lead to a trade-off essentially you can choose one or the other because if you've got a fall in unemployment so more people are employed workers will be in a stronger position because there are there's less choice of firms essentially and if firms want to get the best workers because no one's really desperate to get a job because everyone can get a job who wants a job the workers will demand higher wages and the firms will have to offer these higher wages to attract the best workers to them and this leads to cost push inflation because wages are a major cost of production. So when the cost of production rises, the costs rise, so prices rise essentially. And that is inflation, not very good. That's a wage price spiral can occur there. And then we'll have less competitive goods and services on the international market because if we've got inflation another country doesn't, our exports seem expensive, their imports seem cheap, so we import more and export less. And this isn't good because it leads to an increased balance payments deficit, which is never a very good thing because it leads to lots of money leaving the country, goes out of our circular flow of income, and we can never really get it back unless we suddenly do amazingly. We're now going to look at the reduction of inflation and the effect it has on employment. If we reduce inflation by reducing demand, which is what we tend to do, because if we reduce demand, it means... Firms have to put their prices down in order just to sell the stuff they've made. That obviously, if prices are falling, that's deflation. Or if they're not fall if they're not rising by a lot, that is just very slight inflation or price stability, and that leads to unemployment and negative multiplier effect. If firms are producing less, they need less workers, which leads to people being struck off. Those people have reduced demand, so that leads to more and more people being struck off, and that leads to quite serious unemployment. And that's short term, but long term, we've reduced this demand in the UK, and 
inflation's fallen, so we're more internationally competitive because our prices are now lower than our competitors, or they're at the same level. And that means there's increased demand from abroad. So we have increased demand for labour in the UK for production to make products to sell abroad. And that's increased employment in the UK because we need people to make the goods and services which are going to sell to abroad to meet the demand for UK products and services from abroad. So a lot of economists think export-led growth is the way out because you get employment and price stability. We're now going to look at demand-side causes of unemployment. And demand-efficient unemployment really encapsulates them all, don't know what the word is, but it does that to all of them so it sort of covers them and that's when there's insufficient aggregate demand in the economy to employ available labour and this goes hand in hand with cyclical unemployment. When you're in a negative output gap so aggregate demand is quite low, it's below the full employment level so people lose their jobs because there simply isn't the demand there for the goods and services that these people would have been producing. They get struck off and that leads to a negative multiplier effect, I think I've literally just done this. There's also a video I made on the multiplier effect if you want to watch that as well. And another video later on, we're going to look at all the different policies the government can use to try to stimulate demand to rise again, to try to get these people back into work. Now we're going to look at expenditure-based unemployment, which is when the government cuts expenditure, which leads to job losses in the public sector. So say the government spent £5 million on the NHS in one year, and the next year only paid £3 million towards the NHS. There's £2 million gone missing there, and one way to try to you know, cut costs of the NHS to try to make sure it fits into its budget would be to strike people off. So some nurses, doctors, surgeons, admin staff, cleaners, whatever, they're going to lose their jobs. It's really tragic. Oh, God, I sound so sarcastic then. Obviously, it is really devastating. So those people have lost their jobs, which really isn't good. And another way people can lose their jobs is deindustrialization, which is the reduction of industrial activity in the economy. So production is cheaper abroad, especially due to the fact that they haven't got a minimum wage. We do. They can produce making stuff really cheap because they don't have to pay their staff hardly anything. We have to pay our staff £5, £6 an hour. Not so good. Well, it's good for them, obviously, because it means we've got more equality within the economy, but we're not competitive on an international market. So industries in the UK have to decline because industries in other countries are booming. So we're losing jobs, essentially, to overseas industries. So that leads to unemployment in the UK. Sad times for us, but, I mean, it's good for the other countries because they've got really high employment at our cost, sadly. And then we have investment-based unemployment, which goes hand-in-hand -hand with technolog technological unemployment, which you may have looked at at GCSE. Investment can either be really good for workers or really bad. If they're investing in workers, in labour, great, because it means loads more jobs are provided. If they're investing in capital equipment, not so good. You're going to be replaced by machines, because machines are much cheaper and much more effective than you. So that's investment-based unemployment. Hopefully you will recognise all of these from GCSE, if you did these at GCSE, we have frictional, voluntary and structural. Frictional is when people move between jobs, it's also known as search and, uh, unemployment. So, say I was working milking cows and they decided it wasn't the life for me and I wanted to become an accountant. There's going to be a period where I'm not working because I need to acquire the skills to become an accountant. You've got to have quite a few qualifications, I've forgotten what they're called, but you need quite a lot of qualifications to become an accountant. So in the period of me moving between jobs, that's frictional unemployment. Voluntary unemployment is when workers aren't prepared to take job at current wage rates. So maybe there's a job opening in the local fast food restaurant, but I don't want to work in that sweaty environment for £5 an hour, so I'm going to claim benefits instead. I'm just going to say I can't find a job, claim some benefits and wait for the opportunity to arise for me to get a job at a higher level. I mean, obviously, I'm using myself as an example here. I'm not looking for a job anywhere. I'm not actually going to turn down a job if I can get one. But if I was, you know, turning that down, that's voluntary unemployment. Other voluntary unemployment could be when you've got a housewife, maybe you've got, or a house husband, so you've got a partner who's rich and a lot of money, rather than a family, you don't need to work, so you're going to there, raise your children and stuff like that. And moving on to structural unemployment, ooh, that's changes in the structure of the economy leading to a lot of regional unemployment, actually, because workers are occupationally and geographically immobile. For example, in the mining villages, I think Mansfield might have been one, but was Mansfield a mining village? I can't remember. But you get lots of mining villages and or towns or cities. And if the mines closed, like when Thatcher closed all the mines, they suffered really badly from regional unemployment because workers became struck off because there's nowhere to work if the mines have closed. So they were unemployed, leading to a negative cyclical effect in the economy, so negative multiplier effect there. 
because less demand in the economy leads to downturn of the area. But everyone's stuck in this area. They're occupationally immobile because no one wants miners because the mining business has collapsed. So they haven't got the right skills to take on another job. And they're geographically immobile because they're in Mansfield and all the jobs are in London. They simply cannot afford to buy housing in London. I mean, the government can try to help with this by giving occupational training to get them the right skills to take a new job, maybe giving them loans and grants in order to buy a new house. This is very expensive. Where are we going to get the money from? I don't know. Finally, unemployment and output gaps. When we've got a positive output gap, we've got lots and lots of aggregate demand, which leads to increasing employment because people are required to work to make sure that the products are produced to meet this demand. This leads to a really tight labour market because all pretty much all the workers are being used in their skills, use their jobs, you know, they've got jobs, so there's hardly anyone left. And obviously in a tight labour market that means that wages have to increase for firms to attract the best people or attract the, you know, few people that haven't got jobs yet. So that leads to wage price spiral, so that's quite bad for inflation. And then we have our negative output gaps, when decreasing aggregate demand leads to a negative multiplier effect and cyclical unemployment, lack of demand, lack of demand for labour, lots of people lose their jobs. This leads to discouraged workers, especially in long periods of output, negative output gap. If there's a really lengthy negative output gap, lots of unemployed people. If you lose the, leave the labour market, it can be very, very hard to get back in. And people might just totally leave it altogether. They'll say, I've got no hope, I'm never going to get back in, and they'll just spend their life on benefits which is obviously not so good for the budget because it leads to a budget deficit. So that's really not good. In negative output gaps, the government really needs to be trying their hardest to make sure we don't lose workers. And because in negative output gaps, inflation is so much of an issue, you'll often get governments using fiscal and monetary policies in order to try to encourage employment rather than try to decrease inflation. Woo! That is the end of the employment and unemployment stuff. Hopefully my voice wasn't as annoying this time as when it was the first time I recorded this. I mean, you never heard it, but literally it drove me mad to listen to it, so that would be pretty bad. Anyway, I hope this video has helped. Good luck on your exam, and have a lovely day. I will see you next time for Balance of Trade. Fun, fun, fun.